Hello, I'm uh, Karim Fizazi, medical oncologist from Gustave Roussy in France, and I'm here for this e-cancer event uh, in San Francisco during the ASCO GU meeting, which was uh, actually, which, which is an exciting one. And uh, we've heard the data from the prostate cancer session yesterday, so uh, we thought it was a very good opportunity to wrap up uh, regarding the data for men with castration-resistant prostate cancer with no detectable uh, metastatic disease. And this is because we had, in the last year or so, a uh, lot of new data for these men. So we're going to try to see what we think about uh, this data. So together with me today, I have uh, Nicolas Motte, uh, who is a professor in urology in France. We have Eleni Statue, a medical oncologist of at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. We have Boris Adashik, uh, professor in Germany, and uh, we will try to, to see whether there are differences between all the countries, between all our approaches, with regards to use of treatments, imaging, management of patients, all these things. So just to get started, Nicola, can you summarize for us what was the situation, let's say January the 1st, 2018, so more than a year ago, before, before we had any data for these men with castration-resistant uh, prostate cancer and no detectable disease, what the guidelines said at that time? Or something very simple, keep going with the ADT. Don't do anything more if the patient is asymptomatic. Re-image every time the PSA double, or if the patient becomes symptomatic, and treat when it becomes castrate resistant metastatic. Right. Very simple. Okay. Wasn't that difficult clinically? And I'm asking the question to all of you uh, in, in, in the clinic to see a patient with a rising PSA who was Christ castrated and telling him, well, I'm not going to do anything else but continue your ADT. We're just going to wait for the metastasis to happen. So, how, how was it in the clinic? Oh, it was, it, it was quite difficult. It was, it was difficult, well, in France we had the opportunity to say well, all the drugs that are available for castrate resistant metastatic are mm -hmm. not li licensed for non-metastatic, mm -hmm. so we are not allowed to use them. Right. And uh, at the same time we had no idea if treating earlier was better than treating a little bit later, mm -hmm. so, but in fact it was difficult. Oh, oh, my PSA is rising. Indeed, yes. How do you do? Uh, Eleni? Some well, absolutely. And I think if it's difficult for a person of your status to say that, and imagine in the community practices, because patients would go and they're not like, you know, you're a person who writes the guidelines, who's worked on it. Another practitioner who's more in everyday practice would have the difficulty of actually convincing the patient that, yes, this is what you should do. And I think that explains the big uptake of the first generation antiandrogens mm -hmm. that we've seen, or low dose steroids, things that have never proven a benefit. Indeed, yes. Boris, we've, we've heard you know, in the last year that two trials, Prosper and Spartan, were positive by their primary endpoints of metastasis free survival. Can you please summarize the data for us? Where will country stand with these two trials? Yeah, so last year, um, here in San Francisco as well, both Prosper and Spartan studies were um, presented and they remarkably hit the same uh, or showed the same effect on metastasis-free survival by improving this outcome by 70% for men with high-risk non-metastatic uh, prostate cancer. I mean, this is a novel endpoint. We don't really know what to do with MFS. It is, you see something on imaging. Does this really translate to overall survival? We have to see. The, it looks like it, and also data shown here shows that it seems to correlate with overall survival. But um, more importantly, um, especially in Spartan, also data has been shown that by treating these men earlier with novel uh, medications such as apalutamide or enzalutamide, we are also prolonging symptomatic progression-free survival. So um, there is a hint that these novel medications given early are really improving patient outcome. Um, so, if you, we decide to treat men early, the other question is, besides spending money, uh, how is the, the, the uh, quality of life of these men? And reassuringly, in both studies, uh, the quality of life and in follow-up presentation that came out last year, it has been shown that um, 
despite these men being asymptomatic at the start of the study, their quality of life was not reduced very much by adding ENSA or apalutamide to ongoing ADT. So I, I think these were brilliant um, data that have been shown and that kind of answered the question that earlier treatment makes sense in this setting. But uh, we have to know that, we, that all OS data is immature yet. So we really don't have a very hard endpoint and we will follow these men longer to find out whether um, our beliefs are come true that also overall survival is prolonged by giving treatment early. Right, thank you. So this year, actually, yesterday, we've heard the Aramis data with a third agent. From you. Which yeah. is, <laughs> yeah, just you. Yeah, that it was, was you. me, it was indeed, you. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. But, uh, so, that was Aramis uh, with darolutamide, very similar design as compared to Spartan and Prosper that you just described. And darolutamide is perhaps a different beast, at least chemically speaking. Um, it's structurally distinct, and maybe thanks to that, it doesn't go into the brain, and that's probably the main difference. What we saw regarding efficacy was actually pretty much the same thing, with MFS being the primary endpoint, very uh, dramatically improved with darolutamide. We also saw that overall survival was improved by, with a risk reduction of about 29%. Uh, while pain progression was also improved with about a 35% reduction in the risk. So we do have MFS, but also, you know, clinical, you know, uh, improvement uh, with, with these agents, and, and hopefully uh, the lo a longer follow-up will, will, will tell more. Now, with, in Aramis, uh, with darutamide, the safety sounds to, to favor this drug, I believe, uh, we, we were actually surprised to see that there was basically no difference between darutamide and placebo for most of these adverse events, mostly CNS-related <coughs> events, uh, such as um, uh, fatigue, uh, cognitive impairment, seizure, really no difference, but also falls and fractures were, were, were not different between I'm sorry placebo to interrupt you. and you, darutamide. You, you mentioned that mm -hmm. you were including even patients who had histories yeah. of seizures. They were allowed. Just, yeah, they, they were in the trial. Very different. Yeah. And now. still, the seizure incidence is, is really the same. And cardiovascular uh, in, um, adverse events were also very, very similar with placebo. So we now have three drugs, and hopefully they, they will be approved and reimbursed in all different countries. But the, the field has maybe changed since we've conducted this trial some years ago. And we now, depending on other countries, we now have access to next generation imaging. For example, in Germany, I believe PSMA uh, PET is quite easy to get. So wh what is your experience and, and does it really change the way you treat this man? So first of all, congrats to the great study yesterday. I think darolutamide is really promising. And uh, I mean, it makes life more interesting for us if we can choose between three drugs. At the moment, we only have two approved, but uh, it, it's nice. So in Germany, uh, this is absolutely true. We do a lot of next generation imaging because access to it is uh, reasonably easy and the price is not as high as, for example, in the States. Um, but we always have to remember that um, we don't know whether that stage migration that we cause by next generation imaging is really translating to any oncologic benefit. So for example, we presented data on Spartan-like uh, patients last year at SUO, and we will also show this data at EAU and AUA. And if you apply next generation imaging to men with non-metastatic CRPC on conventional imaging, you will see in more than 50% distant metastases. Yeah, so we know that these men at high risk of progression because of a short PSA doubling time, they do have at least micrometastases. Mm -hmm. And so now we have three trials showing that these men benefit with systemic treatment. So I think the value of really doing next generation imaging in that setting is not as high as in the setting of biochemical recurrence where we aim for cure. Um, so imaging used to be done a lot in that, or not a lot, but it used to be done in the NM CRPC setting to see metastasis, to get access to drugs with approval for metastases. But uh, I mean, these drugs were approved on conventional imaging as well. So at this point in time, for a patient with no metastases on conventional imaging, I don't care about the result of okay. PET because I know I can 
provide benefit with one of the three new drugs. Makes sense. Nicola, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Or? Completely, yeah. completely agree. But even if, even if uh, the, the two trials, the three trials are very positive in terms of a primary endpoint, as a simple-minded clinician, I just don't want to have less meds. I want my patients to live better. Mm -hmm. I've never seen any quality of life benefit in any of the three trials. There is no detrimental effect of the drug, but there is, at least to my knowledge, there is no benefit yet. Probably it's too early. And on top of that, I want my patients to live longer, and I'm still waiting for that. And all that only applies to those patients with a very rapidly progressing PSA. Indeed, yes. Those with a slow-growing PSA, we are still in a trouble. Sir, your PSA is rising. I have nothing to offer to you. That's true. Eleni, regarding imaging and whether yeah. this is convincing enough to, to be ready for prime time and be used in, let's say, fit men with a, a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months. Is that convincing enough, or do we need more clinical data if you see a patient tomorrow? Uh, you're referring to imaging. I think I would agree and echo the comments of, of both urologists here that, indeed, there is no place, unless you're planning to include in a trial, that's interrogating a specific issue. Especially in the rapid to PSA yeah. doubling time, there's a lot of data associating with metastases happening very soon mm -hmm. and shortly. Now, going back to the data, I think that Fred Saad's publication in the Lancet Oncology did the analysis based on the benefit of quality of life. And what they did in the Spartan analysis is that they did not take off the patients who were progressing from the analysis. And it shows when progression starts happening, the benefit that the patient is on apalutum. And you're absolutely right, probably because these men are symptomatic and none of the trials have I seen them get better. Having said that, because you are the king of guidelines, it's up to you now when the time comes to update to make it clear to us and the community that now that we're going to be treating with these new agents, the first thing to look at is to actually try to make lives better and cause no harm. And that's going to be very personalized, is my impression, because we saw through the trials that we may, even in big institutions and great places, we may not doing exactly what's best when monitoring their other morbidities and comorbidities. So and that's my Actually, fear. the median age mm -hmm. in these three trials was almost 75 years. So this is not exactly what we saw in, castra in metastatic castration-sensitive disease or even in MCRPC, men who are younger in the trial. Here we're really talking about mostly elderly population. And I agree with you, we need to, really to take into consideration the comorbidities, the likelihood for survival, what, what about bone health, for example? What do we know now regarding whether we are arming this patient with a super uh, castration or super AR targeting uh, when, they ha when they are 75-year-old M0 CRPC men? What do you think? So they already, and, and I have to speak from the side of practicing more in the U.S., there already you have a gentleman who's been on androgen deprivation, walks in the room, probably not being coached, that you should not be obese, you should not have a metabolic syndrome, it's already in place, sarcopenia is, is in place with muscle loss. Usually, more than often, nobody has done even a baseline bone density, and you do not see, or a vitamin D assessment, or what have you, and you don't see any preventive measures in place. And I have to say, that is not, I'm not speaking just about the community, even within my department, which is a premier cancer center, we have, we're not even following the algorithms of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think that the previous two trials, and, and you know, maybe darolutamide has a little bit of a different a spin to it when it comes to the impact it has. But the, the data showed that in all three trials, and you showed it yesterday, very few patients went on bone protective agents. So that's up to you now to fix, because we're obviously not showcasing as much the need to actually take care of bone health. But if, I'm, if I may answer for that point, specific point, uh, we clearly said in the guidelines and when you give ADT, you have to check the bone. That's the first thing. We also clearly said that uh, there is no place for bone protective agent provided they are not right. osteoporotic. 
or osteopenic going to osteoporotic? Well, it's very, very close. close. If they are mi very close to minus two, yeah. probably How about to counseling on resistance training and the like, which is a hard it's thing? It's strong evidence level one recommendation. It's completely written on the and table. And it's also cheap, you know. It's, like it's absolutely f almost for free. Yeah. But the real issue is who is reading the guidelines, who is taking care of the guidelines? People are have reading to be them. quite disappointing with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we are. Let, let I read me, your guidelines all the time. <laughs> the time is They're running. Uh, let me ask you a simple question, and please provide your most honest uh, and fast answer. If tomorrow you would see a patient with M0 CRPC, a PSA in time of less than, less than 10 months, no or minor comorbidities, and uh, let's say that in your country, those three drugs are available and reimbursed, or at least one of them, regardless of, of which one that is. Would you recommend that to your patient? Boris, what, what would you say? Yeah. Based on the current knowledge. I would recommend it because I believe that we see a small benefit in quality of life because the detriment is delayed by two years. So I think that is something, and you help the patient. I mean, in the trials, PSA was blinded, yeah, but in routine clinical practice, the patient is happy if he sees his PSA going down, and I can guarantee it because all trials showed that the PSA is dropping. So, it. yes. Okay, thank you. Eleni. I'm already using the two agents. I have to say that comfort zone is very important. I'm not yet exposed to using darolutamide. It's a matter of time, I guess, in the United States. So as, as soon as I get comfortable with that agent, I will be very happy to actually explore it in the clinic. The results with using either endolutamide or apalutamide in this setting in this past year to six months have been exactly like you described, quite reassuring. But these patients need monitoring. We must not forget Nicola, that. would would you advise your patients to get one of these free drugs? Absolutely, yes. And I can tell you, and the argument, the, for me, the main argument is the benefit for symptoms, symptomatic progression that was clearly deferred in one of the three trials. And actually, I can, actually two, because we yeah. have pain progression in our arms. Correct. It's two now. Correct. For the two, well, for the two published trials. Well, it's published too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and uh, I can tell you the guidelines clearly say that for the M0 CRPC with a PSA doubling time of less than 12 or 10 months, it's standard of care now to use one of these drugs. So the guidelines have changed based on the three trials. Fair enough. Thank you very much. So thank you for listening to us today. That was fun doing. Thank you very much. We enjoyed the cancer event. Bye-bye.